I was just waiting for the person to get up here. <laughs> you okay? You good? Yes, Father's Day, is, um, as we've uh, emphasized. And uh, we, you, you'll see that there's the title, Culture of Honor. I just thought, yeah, I was trying to think of a title. I thought that was as good as any, really. But actually, it is a, t- a time when we honor male leaders. And uh, it can be a, a, a challenging time, and I'll we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but it is a time when we honor male leaders, and you can be a father and, and not have any children. You can be a spiritual father. And uh, we need spiritual fathers. The church needs fathers. It, it needs men. And, you know, this is so politically incorrect, okay? But hey-ho, right? <laughs> we, we need men of God to stand in the gap. I did not write this stuff. God did. It was God's idea. And we can get into all the thing about gender and in his God, male and female. What a great study that would be, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so Father's Day, it's, um, how did it start? Um, it's strange, isn't it? Yeah, as you say, John, I, I did mother, Mothering Sunday and now... I don't know if they're going to do a granddad's day, but I guess I'll get to do that. <laughs> but how did it start? Well, actually, it's been around since the Middle Ages in Europe, but it was never really, never really took off or, or recognized. And it wasn't until 1908 um, in West Virginia in the USA because of a... Um, 365 men died in a mining accident, and they wanted to honor these men. So they had a special service. You, you Google all this, you'll find the history there. And out of that, it, st- it didn't take off straight away, but then about a year later, something happened, and it, and it moved on until we are where we are today. But it is also a painful time. It is for some. It's a painful time for those who long to be fathers in the natural and you never had that opportunity. It's a painful time for those who are fathers but you're somehow disenfranchised from your child or children. I speak from experience. I've been there. I know. So if you uh, have got that kind of pain, I, I stand with you today. Because God, and it may be God wants to bring in that healing into your life. It may, it may be a difficult time for some of our brothers who have traveled hundreds, thousands of miles to be here. And they're disenfranchised from their family. Come on. It, it, it's, this is not, um, we're not going to start this message from a, woo-hoo. This, we're starting this message from a reality. God's a God of reality, and he cares for you. He cares, and I want to speak, and those watching online, those watching on YouTube, I want to speak into your lives. Guys and girls, pray for the guys. I mean, I don't pre- mean, pre- and when we were teenagers in the church, the girls were praying for guys, but not in the same way. We pray, we pray, we uphold and honor one another. My situation, in a former life, before I was married to Jane, the relationship I was in, I was married, it did not last very long, it was a difficult situation, and I'm not going into detail here. I'll tell you in private, but not online, and certainly not on press. But it was difficult. Out of that union came a little girl called Rebecca. And that was the best thing that ever happened. However, I lost contact with her for a variety of reasons. 
I lost contact with this little girl from the age of four. And for 26 years, I did not know whether Rebecca was alive or dead. I did not know whether she was happy. I did not know if she was alive, what she thought about me. I didn't know where she was. There's so many layers of stories here. You know, it says in Job that uh, Job went through all these troubles. But at the end, I love the end bit. Job 42 is my favorite chapter. Because he gets double for all his trouble. Amen. (laughs) And you know, through time I met Jane. And Jane had already got Sarah and Anthony. And I became their dad. And, and really, it was not stepdad. They do not want me to say I'm the stepdad. We have a wonderful, God-given, blessed relationship. Yeah. In actual fact, some of you remember the East Sussex Bible Week, which we were part of. They had us in the youth tent on the platform <laughs> because we were modeling the perfect family. <laughs> I sign in autographs, you know, and all <laughs> there's, a, there's a program that you may watch or have watched at some point. It's called Long Lost Family. Anybody seen that? Yeah, I watch it. I, I watch it less now, but when it first came out, because it's so related to my situation, watching it in floods of tears, you know, they, 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 they don't know who their dad is. They don't know who their mom is. They don't know... And they find them, and you see that moment, and they say, oh, um, we, found, we found your son, we found your father, we found your mother. And they say, wow, so we've got a photograph, do you want to see it? Wow. And then they see the photo. Well, it, it relates to me, because for 26 years, I was... I didn't know if Rebecca was alive or dead. Somebody, people said to me, I would talk about her, and I, I talk about her now. People would say to me, well, why don't you search for her? And I said, I can't search for her. Why can't you search for her? Because it's too painful. What if I find her? What if I find that street? What if I find that house? What if I find the number of that house? What if I knock on the door? And she says, go away. And this is going to relate to some people in this room. It's going to relate to some people watching online because God is in the midst of this. God will work through the circumstances. But what I didn't know is Sarah, our daughter, searched for her behind my back. (laughs) To cut a story short, it ended up with a four-page handwritten, you know, uh, Four pages of A4 handwritten letter from Rebecca. And uh, I'm going to give a quote, just one quote from that letter. She wrote, I've always wondered what you're like and what you look like. Wow. We were in Portsmouth at the time and we were in an afternoon meeting. It was like a social meeting. Uh, country and western, you'd have loved it. Um, And I got a text from Sarah saying, get to your computer, I've just seen a picture of Rebecca. She's gorgeous. Well, it was the longest hour of my life because I couldn't get out of this meeting. But yes, sure enough, she's gorgeous, she's intelligent, and I don't know where she gets all that from. Just, just, just catch up with this. Come. It's in the DNA, you know. Just, uh. Uh, so that's the story of Rebecca. Sometimes religion has distorted what Heavenly Father's like. In actual fact, it's always religion that distorts what our Heavenly Father's like. See, there's a connection. I've could, I could tell you so many stories. Uh, a church weekend, a whole series of Bible studies could do this, but the time wouldn't allow. But I've had so many encounters with God regarding what God our Father is like relating to how I feel. And you dads, you know that. Come on, 
put your hands up if you know that. You know. You feel it. And God speaks into your life at that very moment, in that darkness, in that, or even in the bright moment. And he said, that's how I am. He is a, a heavenly father. And he's, when we say he's portrayed as father, it's in the Old Testament. There's loads of references which I haven't got time to go into. Look it up. Google it. We used to have Cruden's Concordance. Anybody remember that? Cruden's Concordance. You'd look up everything. You don't have to do that now. You just go. I discovered the other day, I'm a bit slow on these things. You speak into Google and it finds it. I mean, come on. So I, last night I was doing this and I spoke in to see if they knew who I was. It's scary. <laughs> scary, scary. But they still think I'm a Baptist minister. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> don't tell them, right? Don't tell them. The New Testament, Jesus' favorite term for God was Father. This intimacy. And uh, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we call the synoptic Gospels, ask me afterwards. His father is mentioned 65 times. And in the Gospel of John, 100 times. Wow, what an emphasis. And I want to tell you what an emphasis on the father. He is... Um, yeah, if we could take that off for a sec, that'd be great. Um, the, he is, we're not quite there yet, but he is the, our father. There's a story, and some of you will know this story if you've done the Alpha course. How many ever done an Alpha course in this room? Yeah, well, it was about, yeah, roughly half. We all know this story. The story of the boy who was uh, sitting at the table and he was drawing. His mum says to him, what are you drawing? Oh, I'm drawing a picture of God. Mom says, don't be silly. Nobody knows what God looks like. Well, they will do when I finish my drawing, he said. <laughs> the New Testament paints a very clear picture of what God, our Father, well, what God looks like, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, um, yeah. So we'll put that scripture up that you kindly put up before in John 14. And it says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been with, along, among with you all this time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Excuse me. Anyone who has seen Jesus, do you want to know what the Father looks like? Have a look at Jesus. And so Jesus modeled this, and we heard John referring to this, John 5, 19. I only do what I see my father doing. And in the Hebrew writer writes this, Hebrews 1, 3. The Son, that's Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Did you hear that? Yeah, you won't find what the Father's like in religion. You won't find what the Father's like. All, all of the Old Testament, though it's relevant, and we learn from it, it's all pointing towards this crescendo of the appearing of the Son of God. And through Jesus, we understand the Old Testament. Well, that's how I understand it. Through Jesus, we understand what the Father's like. He is the radiance of the glory of the glory. He is the exact representation of it. He's sustaining all things by his powerful word. I said all things. Yes. After he had provided his purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Oh my word. That's what God looks like. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. When I, when I retired, I decided to go through the Gospels again. Go, I want to see what this Jesus is like. Because in seeing what Jesus is like, you'll see what the Father's like. Always there. Always there. And you, the, there is a study called typology. And you, you can see all the types through the Old Testament. And uh, it's great fun at, at worst. 
and it's absolutely wonderful at best to do that study, honestly. Um, so Colossians, Paul writes this, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Isn't that isn't great? Isn't God great that he would want to send us a picture so that we want to see what God is like, just as my daughter wanted to see what I look like. So we can see what he's like through that. The Amplified says it's the visible representing the invisible. I love that. The visible representing the invisible. So the, for the remainder of this time, I want to talk ab- ab- about three areas about God, our Father. The Father's heart, the Father's promise, the Father's will. So I'm going to get you to repeat it back to me. The Father's heart, the Father's promise, the Father's will. So if, you, if we don't get through all this stuff or I have to skip or whatever, you've got it now. There's your word. I'll give it to you. If I've got hand paper, i just throw it at you and say you've got it now. Okay. There's, this is another true story, the story of a, a little boy who was rescued from an orphanage in Romania. Uh, when, when the political situation changed in Romania, some people from our church, which I wasn't part of it then, but they'd gone over to Romania, they got these connections, and they went to this orphanage, and there was, you've seen some of the pictures, the children are just rocking in total anxiety and stress. You, these images are not just Romania, they're, they're right across the world and will be there. And so they went through the process, these are friends of ours, they went through the process of adopting this boy called Mikey. And it took ages, but they adopted him. They had two sons. They brought him into the family. Do you remember we talked about you're welcome at the table? They brought him into the family, to the table, and he was on equal status with these two, the two natural-born sons. He struggled a bit in his first bit of his education, but he did okay, and he's doing okay now. And to this, he's now a father himself. He, this this happened because somebody took the trouble to rescue him from the this orphanage and bring him into a family. I want to tell you something. This world is an orphanage. This, think about it. This world is an orphanage. What do you mean it's an orphanage? Well, you see, if God made everything, if we believe the Bible, this is a Bible-believing church, right? So if we believe the Bible, God made everything, okay? So we all came originally from God, but because of the fall, we cut off from God. So God, we're all related, and then we were cut off, and we're all, this whole world, because of sin, is put into the orphanage. Come on. We're all in the orphanage, and God, <laughs> this is the gospel of Christ. God comes through Jesus and rescues us from all our anxieties, from the orphanage. Awesome. This is good stuff. I'm glad I turned up. (laughs) Paul writes, I will be a father to you, says God, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. In Romans 8, 15, it says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves. We sang that. No longer a slave so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought you from adoption into sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This is the Father's heart, friends, to bring us into his family, to take us from the orphanage into his family. And... The question I have for all of us is, are we part of the family? 
I'm not asking whether you're a member of this church. I'm not asking if you're a member of any church. I'm not asking if you're signed up for this, that, the other. I'm asking. I'm not asking you what, whether you're giving. I'm asking you, are you a member of his, the family of God? Have you been taken from that orphanage into his wonderful family? If you, you know if you have. Have you been adopted? You see, there's no criteria or qualifications except you turn away from your old way of lifestyle. Um, we do illustrations. Preachers do illustrations, right? But the illustrations for always fall short. So the illustration of Mikey in the orphanage, he had no choice. He was just, unless somebody picked him up, he'd be there. And he'd die there. But it's not the same for us. See, that's a sort of kind of a passive thing. And some people are passive about their faith. Some people are passive about their uh, life. Well, okay, sirrah, sirrah, you know, I hope God will do something. But it's not like that in the scriptures. It's not. Like, you see, we can make some choices. For, we can take some action. We can say, I don't want to be in this orphanage anymore. I don't want to be abandoned anymore. And we can turn to him and be saved. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So, I no longer want to be an orphan. I don't want to be part of this universal orphanage. I want to be a part of the family of God. So, the Father's heart is made possible by sending Jesus. Watch this. And this is good because I wrote it. Okay. He's made it possible by sending Jesus to this earth. And then Jesus walks with his father. He talks with his father. And then he comes to the day and he goes to the cross. What do we see? Psalm 22 played out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, Jesus became an orphan. He became an orphan so that we don't have to. He went into the depths of hell so that we don't have to. And he ascended into heaven so that we can. Come on. Jesus, this is the Father's heart. Jesus, I can't imagine being an orphan. But he chose us just as that family chose Mikey. So God chooses us. Look at this, Ephesians 1, 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. There's some, a lot of theology in this. Some people will go, choosing, so does he choose not to? You know, Watch the phrases in that. Watch that. For he chose us, look at that, in him. Some versions will say, in Christ. And the Amplified says he actually picks us out. That's the classic version. He picks us out. So how does that mean? He picks some out and not others? Well, I don't think so. This is the, the great theology of you know, election and predestination and all of those things that you go, who? But we need to say it. We need to air it. He chose us in Christ. When Christ died on the cross, those 2,000 years ago, he chose me. When Christ died on the cross, he chose you. And Christ died on the cross. He chose every single person in this town, in this nation, and in the nations. So that all may come. Whosoever will may come in Jesus' name. Come on, I'm preaching good here. Just a bit of affirmation and, uh, you know, a bit of stroking now and then. Behave. Adoption means the parent made the choice. The parents made the choice. And this choice is is God's love. See this on the screen. It says that it is. God's love is extravagant. It's purposeful. It's inseparable. It's powerful. Wow. Sorry about this. These words that end in similar. And, you know, I'm I'm doing my best to... uh, Anyway, forget it. <laughs> it's extravagant. I'll let you look at those scriptures yourself. You guys on your phone, you're good. Well, I'll, I'll just give you that first one. 1 John 3, 1. It, it says in the uh, NIV, it says, 
Um, but look what love the Father has lavished upon us. It's lavished. Whoa. The old version, you say, behold. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That's how it would read. And it's purposeful. He says, why were we yet sinners? Christ died for us. Hallelujah. It's inseparable. What can separate us from the love of God? It's your tribulation, it's your trials, for difficulties. No, nothing can separate us from this Father's heart. And it's powerful. 1 John 4, 18, I wonder if anybody knows that is. Well, I'll tell you what it is before you go searching. It says that perfect love drives out fear. It's powerful. It's powerful. Powerful. So the Father's promise, Holy Spirit's presence and power. Jesus said his followers would receive the gift of the promise, the Father, that the Father sent, in the, the, which is the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, on the screen. Thanks, guys. You're doing a great job, by the way. It says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything, everything I have said to you. Luke 24, 49. Jesus has resurrected Jesus. He's before Pentecost. He's before Ascension. And he says, I'm going to send what my Father has promised. To, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Oh, I'd love to have more time on that. Stay in the city. We don't, well, we don't just jump on a plane and go to Jerusalem, although it's one, wonderful to go. But you don't know. You stay in that place of encounter until you have a further encounter. You got it? Stay in that place of encounter until you get a further encounter. That's how I understand that. And in Acts 1, 4, after Jesus has ascended and he, before he ascends, just on that day, ascension day as we call it, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard about. And then we see in Acts 2, that they're filled with the Spirit and and uh, we see, and some people say, well, that was a one-off, but if you go into Acts 10, this is not on the screen, Acts 10, when the Cornelius, who is a Gentile, he, rece he receives, and they said, they've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So they spoke in tongues just as they did. They prophesied just as they did. Come on. It's there. I'm a, you see, I'm not a cessationist. I'm a continuist. That it continues. Continues. And so in Acts 2, 39, Peter addresses the crowd and he said, this promise is for you. This are the immediate people there, your children, the next generation, and all who are far off, that's all the nations, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. Anybody be called? Are you here because God's calling you? Then the promise is for you. And it's the promise of the Father, Holy Spirit, lives and abides in us. And there's a lovely verse which I've been meditating on in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. And it's in some churches, more traditional churches, they do what they, they call the grace. Should we, have you been in those churches? Should we say the grace to one another? I'd be, if you've never been into it, it's interesting. <laughs> Especially if you're new to church. So everybody gets up, Roger knows, everybody gets up. And you look at each other, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and the love of God. <laughs> Daisy, behave, behave yourself over there. I'm just <laughs> and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. It's a wonderful doxology. It's a wonderful blessing. Watch that word fellowship, koinonia, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the gift of the Father, is right here, right now, in this place, in your life, and in mine. Hallelujah. And he comes with a package, there's loads of gifts, which on another day we can talk about. For it's in the family, it's a family, Father's gifts. 
And you, it, what about me then? You say, what about me? I've never experienced that. Well, you go to Luke. We're not going to go to, but Luke 11. We looked at this in the Zoom prayer meeting. And yes, we have Zoom prayer meetings. Come and join us. And we prayed this on, on Saturday morning, Luke, that ask and keep on asking. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Amen. Just ask. Ask this wonderful Father that you've got a wonderful cameo of. The Father's will. The Father's will. The Lord's prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in the denomination that I belong to. Your will be done on earth as it is among the, according to the social structure and, and the church trying to keep up with the world. No. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in this church, we, we pray the Lord's Prayer many, many times, not in a liturgical, religious way, but in a faith-filled, pressing-in way, to receive the gifts. Amen. And the Father's... W- so we, whatever else we can find, we know that God's will is found in that phrase. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When he sees the carnage, when he sees the terrible suffering, when he sees the, all these things, do you think that's... Gr- do you not think that grieves this Father? He's grieved. He, he's, he suffers with us. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows your need. And he knows mine. And he's touched with these things. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what is his will? What does that look like? What does heaven look like for even? Well, just as we, just as I've now got a picture and I've met my daughter and she calls me dad and and all of that. And I remember the first time she sent me a a Father's Day card and it was very gentle and lovely, and it was like, I bet you haven't, and she said, I bet you haven't had many of these, Dad. Oh. This is the one she sent me now. Dad, there's no one else's terrible jokes I'd rather listen to. <laughs> I expect there's a compliment in there somewhere. <laughs> so just so I have a a picture of what she had a picture of what her dad looked like and we have a picture of what our heavenly father looks like through Jesus so we have a picture of what heaven looks like and here it is it's on the screen there's no sadness oh sorry about the alliteration things <laughs> not really but we're all different aren't we no sadness and tears in heaven No sickness and disease in heaven. No separation and isolation in heaven. That summarizes what heaven looks like. Hello? And Jesus said, pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, God's will was for his kingdom to come. It's God's will for for his will to be done in our lives so that we're changed and transformed. It's his will that we grow in intimacy. It's his will for us to walk in victory and healing and health in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's his will to be fruitful and make disciples. That's his will. And so you say, well, well, I feel terrible now. No, I don't want you to feel terrible. I just want you to come back to the, into the main room of the family and say, God, I want your will. I'm not going to settle for this rubbish anymore. I want God's will. It's his will that all members of our family get saved. Amen. Amen. It's his will. It's his will that the majority come to Christ, not the minority. It's his will that the church, when Jesus comes back, goes out with a flash and a glory. That's his will. I'm not settling for anything, yes. Can we have another half an hour? I'm just getting into this now. Well, we won't have another half an hour. God's will. Jesus explains to a Samaritan woman in John 4, 23. And he says this. It is a great giveaway text. They have this dis- discussion. We can't get into all the who, why, why is he there? And there's a whole message in that. John 4, beautiful. 
But he's talking to the Samaritan woman. And they're talking about where you worship and what you do. And then he says, the father, in verse 23, is looking for true worshipers who worship him in spirit and truth. The father is looking for you. You see, God, God hasn't lost his sat nap. He knows where you are. He wants you to know where you are. Just as we heard Johnny speak a few weeks ago at communion about the fall, and God saying, where are you? He knows where we are. He wants us to know where we are. And he wants, he, he's the, the center, the center, all my theology, all my teaching, all my preaching comes out of my devotional time. The center of God's will is to bring us back into that intimacy with God. It's not as nice little polite word. It's not a special ministry somewhere. God just wants to have that intimacy with you. The Father wants you to have that. Let me illustrate this with this story, and then we'll close. Is that okay? You all right for this story? When we moved back to Eastbourne, we were asked to take on what was still on place, and we changed the name to New Hope. We changed it to New Hope in great faith because at the time there didn't seem to be much of it. It could have been no hope. Honestly, it was, and it was, we were stepping in, and if they're watching this, they'll know. Anyway, they know. I used to say this in the church there. It was not my culture, but we felt that that's where God had placed us, and we stepped into this situation. And the church. Ceylon Place has planted Victoria Baptist, if you didn't know. It planted um, Pemsey Bay Baptist Church and indirectly a community church. It's In its heyday, it has been an amazing church, but it wasn't an amazing church. Uh, they'd lo- they, they had no longer got their building. The, the congregation was in the upper, upper age call a funeral director area. <laughs> and there was about 15, 16 of us. And so we, we had 24 months to turn this around or have a funeral. Well, the church is still there and it's growing and they, they are growing now. So that put that on one side. We didn't have a funeral. We didn't have anything like that. But we did have this time where it was desperate. I was so desperate, I walked around the town, I would put my je- I'd wear my jeans, and I'd put a clerical collar on, and I'd, and I'd assume the town as my parish. You know, when you don't know what to do, just get out there on the streets and look for people. That's what I did. I walked around, I got a clerical collar. Some of the daytime drinkers would say, oh, Father, they call me a priest, see? And I got talking to them. And out of that, we saw somebody get saved out of that. But it was so desperate. How are we going to turn this around? How are we going to change it? And I, I was saying, oh, God, you've got to help me. I'm sitting at the bottom of my garden, and some, sometimes you watch, if you watch my social media stuff, my YouTube channel, and if you don't, why don't you? And if you haven't subscribed, why don't you? But I, I'm sitting there, and some of the images I've done, some of the films from there, sit, and I'm reading a book by uh, Max Lucado. Have you heard of Max Lucado? Great devotional writer. I'm reading this book, and he tells this story of a modern-day prodigal daughter. And uh, this, who, who'd gone away from home. Anyway, the long story short, when, when she was young, she used to sit on her father's lap. But she'd moved away. She'd grown up, adolescence, stuff kicked in. And then he, he goes on how Max is so good at this, bringing it into the now, and, and says the father... Because she wanted to go back and sit on her dad's lap, you see. And so he he says, our Heavenly Father wants us to sit on his lap. In that moment, I said to God, wow. Metaphorically, I'm not sitting on, anyway. Wow, what would that look like? Our Father, I would, like this childlike kid, sitting there in the garden saying, Father, I want to sit on your lap. In that moment, I experienced it. I, I, 
All I know is I was sitting on Heavenly Father's lap. And the peace and the wonder, I was back, I was home. I was where I was meant to be. Oh, and in those moments, I suddenly started to think about all the problems in the church. So I said to God, well, Lord, while I'm here, And I was just about to reel off, you know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? How are we going to turn this around? And God spoke into my heart. Now, don't misunderstand this. He spoke into my heart and he said, I'm not interested. I'm interested in you. That's a great place to end, isn't it? That God is interested in us. That's why he went to all this trouble to take us out of the orphanage. Are you in the orphanage? You see, we can be born again but still be orphans. We need to have no that rescuing. We need to live like children of the family. Little Mikey, an equal with the rest of the two boys. We need to live like, as if we belong to the family. We've heard this through John about who we are in Christ. We need, we, but an orphan spirit says, oh, but I, oh, you know, I'm not worthy. Um, Well, get saved then. Receive Jesus into your life. Come out of the orphanage. It's possible to be born again and still not receive the Father's promise. Oh, I've heard about it, but I've never received the Father's promise. I've never spoken in those other tongues. Wait no longer. Today is your day. Right here, right now. His Father, it's possible to be Born again and not walk in the Father's will. Is God telling you to do something? Is God telling you to step up? Step to the next level? Oh. We had Peter and Liz with us. and They, they were saying about they were challenged to step up and do stuff. And, and Liz said, it was scary. But, you know, you trust God. Maybe God's challenging us to step up to do his will. Father, I just thank you today for your precious word. And we don't want to just, yeah, it's great to hear the stories. But we want, Lord, let this resonate that we see what you are like. Lord, would you just show us if we're still in the orphanage? Right now, where you are, whether, whether you've got your heads bowed or whatever you've got, just where you are, just say, God, I, take me out of this orphanage. It's like saying, Jesus, come into my life. It's like saying, I turn away. It's like saying, I don't want to live this lifestyle anymore. Come out of the orphanage right where you are. And then, as you come out, ask him to fill you with his spirit. Maybe you've walked with the Lord and you just uh, never, never walked in the fullness of the Spirit. Just say, God, I receive your Spirit right now. From the top of my head to the sole of my feet. And now, Lord, as your child, being rescued from that orphanage, I want to take my place. I want your will to be done in my life as it is in heaven. I want to see that sickness be made whole. I want to see uh, people who are separated from you come into faith. I want to see, Lord, the, the, all this stuff that's happening. Lord, use me to do your will. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And if, if any of this has touched into you, that orphan spirit there is, that is real. Come and talk to us about it. John's here. I'm here. Mike, Karen, Jane. There's loads of people here. Your connect group leaders. 
But let God deal with what he needs to deal with. Have a good day. God bless you. And see you at the prayer meeting. Awesome. Thank you, Freddie.